Hello and welcome to the September 2020 Certification Coaching Q&A webinar with your host, Boyd Staszewski here and my wonderful gals, <laughs> Alicia and Jennifer. How's it going, ladies? It's going Hi, wonderful. Hey, both of you looking lovely tonight. Like those curls. Mm -hmm. I got it behind the scenes on the curls tonight. So uh, yep. I got a little specialness <laughs> that you guys don't do we have? Do we have people? I don't see anybody oh, in here Oh gosh, yet. yeah. Let me try that again. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. God, I thought it was so good, too. Welcome to the Certification Coaching Q&A webinar for September 2020 with my hosts, Alicia and Jennifer. Hi, ladies. Hi. Hello. Thank you for that. Boy, didn't hit the broadcast button, so... Uh, we're live with you here today. We are actually live. It's not a pre-recorded anything, right? Mm -mm. Um, yeah, we... Jennifer's in her new house, so you might see her mm -hmm. background be different. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You got Thank any you. news that you yeah. want to share, Alicia, on that? I'm in I'm in Missouri, in my hometown. Yeah. Going back to Texas this weekend. Nice. And I'm in Flint, Michigan here in my studio. So welcome. If this is your first time, we want to hear from you uh, in the chat. We're going to have a poll here in a couple of seconds. Um, you can go to the next slide, Alicia, when you're ready. And okay. if this is your first time, know that you can ask a question anytime. But this is a webinar about all things medical business certification, medical coding, billing, and practice management related with my two experts Alicia Scott, CPC, CPI, CP, no, I forgot the rest. <laughs> Alphabet soup. I know. And Jennifer Scott even more, so help yeah. me. <laughs> Give it to me, Alicia. What is it? Mine is CPC, CPCI, C CRC. How many years all together? For, for me? Yeah. In the medical field or as a coder? Hmm. Let's give you the medical field. 30 years. And, and then the coding field. Actually more, 32. Okay. Coding field over 10, 12. Nice. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer? Certifications uh, and how long in the field? Well, certifications are CPC, CPB, CPMA, CPPM, COSC, CPCI, <laughs> and CEMAO. <laughs> yeah. Medical field since 92, so going on. 30 years? Wow. That's when I'm I started old. in the business, oh, yeah. too. No, no, can I add? Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to say, I was in the medical field before I got married, and actually, I've been married 33 years, So, but that's only because yeah. I started as an EMT at 18. Mm -hmm. That's yep. why. Most well, people can't say that. So. We're glad that you're here, both of you, and thanks for putting that all that time in, put it that way. So let's start our first poll there, Alicia. How many CCO webinars have you attended out there in our audience? Is it more than one? Is Ooh. it a repeat offender? Is it liking it here at CCO, which is five to 10? Or are you a CCO frequent flyer at 10 plus? Wow. I'm watching it, it build right now. I don't, can you guys see that or is it just me? Because I did the poll. Just you. Probably yeah. you. Yeah. We're at 68%. So far, frequent flyers is winning. We Looking generally close it at 70, so you got to hop on this thing if you want to oh, get yeah, your Yeah, that's right. We're, at, get your we're now in. at, yeah, close and share. Let's see here. Read them off. We have 20% is first time. Woot, woot. 11%. Uh, one back for more. Two to five is 29% repeat offender. You know, I could put my glasses on. I could see that better. And then 5%, five to 10, liking it here at CCO. And 35% have come to 10 or more. And they're the mm -hmm. frequent flyers. Nice. Yay. That's awesome, nice. guys. So this is our lineup tonight, and actually Alicia is going to start us off after all this is done. I kind of switched things up this mm. month. Usually we start mm, with okay. with Jennifer, mm. so because uh, she always likes to leave early. No, she doesn't. But anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jennifer, you're still first on the list, though. What are you covering tonight? Um, I'm going to do billing for home services, uh, prolonged service documentation, and the modifier EP. So. Mm. And Alicia. 
I am going to talk about coding procedures both with the CP, uh, the CPT and the PCS for congenital defects, interventional radiology coding, and the uh, cardiac devices. We're going to just explain the cardiac devices and who is the OIG and what do they do? And hmm. you might be surprised at what it is, actually, if you don't know. So this webinar yeah. is going to go about 60 minutes. We've prepared some questions already that our club members and also our uh, general audience has submitted to us at our site at cco.us. Um, and so those are six questions. Then we're going to have a drawing for a prize to give it out to one lucky winner here on the call tonight. And we're also going to take your questions from the chat and try not to ask like complicated questions in the chat so we can answer <laughs> them at the end that don't take a, a manual or a big Google search or uh, optico. What is it? Not op code, 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 opti code, not opti code. Find a code. Find, find a code. code. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> like I should know by now. But again, you can ask a question anytime. And when the ladies aren't answering, we've also got the team in the back. I don't know who's in the background. I know we've got a team there. Uh, probably Lori's in there. I saw Sylvia, but I think Lori's there too. Okay, yeah, great. Awesome. I Maybe Lori's probably there, over yeah. on Facebook yeah. too. So uh, again, yeah. And if you don't have a question answered tonight, you can always go to cco.us slash topic request and answer. Ask it there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, this isn't a Zoom call, so we don't uh, share webcams, so you don't have to worry about that, or we d and we don't hear you, so be care. Be you don't have to worry about that. You can get ready for bed. You can do whatever you want, um, but please you can stay learn coding in your jammies. You can. <laughs> And Is why that you want to your business pajamas or your regular? Pajamas? I'm wearing my professional pajamas today. <laughs> Platter or, or solids? That's really the question. To ask about pajamas. Yeah. Right. So the screen says, please stay to the end to get uh, the, our free drawing. That's going to be a, either a club membership or a call with one of our team members or even a CPC uh, review blitz bundle. Yep. And Alicia, why the club? What is this thing called well, the club, the CCO club? Be in the club. <laughs> be in the club. Well, I think Boyd knows that I like to say, if you want to know more about the club, go to cco.us forward slash club. I don't know why, but I like doing this. And the great thing about the club, which there's more than one great thing about the club. The main thing is you can get CEUs. I would say the second is the networking, the mm -hmm. talking and learning. You know, you can ask questions, you can find mentors and stuff like that. Uh, we're all in the club as well as subject matter experts. There's students in there. There's uh, people that are at different stages of their, their learning in the business. And it just, it's fun, it's exciting. I, I was in there today and was shocked. A couple of the questions were really cool that a student had asked. And so you can see in the club, not just for students, but professionals as well to get your questions answered and the greatest thing of all, I guess, really, is that all the webinars that we do, they're transcribed and they're put in the club with the slide decks. So if you watch us not in the club, you might get to see clips and bits in YouTube, but you don't get that full effect of being able to go back and look at the slide deck and the transcript. That's probably the, the best thing about the club, I think. And we have a couple of different levels, so you have to go to that link to uh, yeah. find out about the pricing and stuff like that, but it's actually quite affordable. So yeah. let's get started with the Q&A here. Uh, that's already been prepared by our wonderful ladies here. And I know that the answer sheets are ready as well because I checked them before we started, right. the webinar. <laughs> yeah, I saw him in there. I could yeah. see him in there looking. <laughs> so uh, Jennifer and I are going to pop off and we're going to get started with Alicia here. All right. The first one that I've got tonight is regarding congenital defects. We had a question come in. It was, I know coding congenital defects makes a difference uh, with some of the procedure codes. What am I missing as I can't seem to find the right codes? Why are these defects coded different than others? You know, I did a little research. Uh, well, I did a lot of research, but let me just pull this over and go to the top. Uh, again, if you're in the club, you get to get all of this information. You get to keep it. The first thing to understand about congenital defects is it simply means it's you're born with it. 
if it's congenital, you're born that way. And um, I guess you could say that being a boy or a girl, that's congenital. If you're, if you got red hair, well, you were born that way. And so here are some of the more common congenital defects. We have cleft lip and cleft palate, where we have uh, different types of missing limbs or malformation of limbs. We have spina bifida here over on the side. This is also a uh, hydrocephaly where the, the fluid is leaking out of the spine or the brain. And then this one I did, is a fragile X syndrome. Uh, but there's also cere cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, uh, let's see, cystic fibrosis. There's a lot of heart conditions. And we're going to talk about those in another one of the, the uh, answer sheets that I have. Knowing all of that, I decided to go ahead and pick one congenital defect to kind of embellish and see what the codes were because honestly, there's 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 a lot. And we're looking at the CPT and the PCS code. So the procedures that are being performed, not the diagnosis code for what the condition is. However, I did put in the footnotes a couple um, articles that were brilliant with both the ICD and the CPT codes. So, uh, and one even had the PCS code. So I think uh, you should reference that if you're needing more information. So going back to the question, you know, what is the congenital uh, defects? We talked about that. Why is it different when you look in the procedures and even both code sets? Why is it different than just right? You know, why don't you code it like everything else? It goes back to the fact that we code for for, I started to say we code for congenital purposes. We code for uh, statistical reasons, for statistical purposes. It just happens to be a convenient way to get paid. So we want to know statistically what procedures are being done on congenital defects versus, um, you know, something else that, that um, happened to a particular person. Now, let's talk about the, the difference. You know, if, you're, if you um, have fragile X, right, that's going to be diagnosed pretty early. Or spina bifida, you know, that would probably be caught very early. Down syndrome. However, there are some, congen some conditions that are congenital that you don't find out until much later in life. And those are kind of hidden conditions, like a heart condition, a heart valve condition. It might not show up, even athletes. Sometimes you hear about a young athlete dying, you know, on the basketball court and come to find out when they did the autopsy, they found out they had a congenital heart defect that never showed up before. Again, why would we want to know any procedures that were done for a congenital defect versus somebody else that had the same type of heart condition that they weren't born with. And so therefore, uh, we're statistically separating those. So I picked the cleft palate, cleft lip uh, to give us examples. And I think through the examples that you'll be able to look at other types of procedures and kind of match that up. Hopefully that'll explain why it's different and that all the different codes that are possible are procedures that can be done for congenital deficits. The first thing for a cleft lip or cleft palate, we're going to look at CPT and they're going to be wanting to do eventually, maybe not right away, a plastic repair of the cleft lip and the nasal deformity. So in the picture, you notice that that the lip, it was split, okay? That's the cleft lip. And then nasal deformity, sometimes that, that will go up into the nose. And other times, it goes up into the palate is even split. Now, if it's just a cleft lip and a cleft into the nose, maybe the baby can still nurse right? But if it gets up into the palate, the baby might not be able to nurse, so they may want to do uh, the surgery in stages. 
and the codes, primary codes for the plastic repair, meaning the skin, is 40700 uh, 4, all the way over to 40761, and this is not a code range, right? Uh, and now look at the different descriptions of the code. We have primarily partial, bilateral, and bilateral stage uh, one and two, because when they do these procedures, they do them in a stage one and stage two, okay? Uh, then we have secondary, uh, because they're going to repair the, the deficit and the um, uh, reclose the lip via recreation. And then uh, with cross lip, pedestal flap. I mean, it's still attached and they're going to move this flap. So those are the plastic repair, the skin itself, but much more that you have to do. Uh, often we need to do rhinoplasty. Now we commonly think of rhinoplasty, someone who has a large nose and they want to uh, change the shape of the nose. Uh, and then there's other times where we have a problem inside the the nose where they're having difficulty breathing. So they'll go in and they'll do rhinoplasty. But notice 30460 is specifically to congenital cleft lip or palate, okay, and or palate, and just the tip of the nose. And then the next code, 30462, same thing, congenital, but it's going to be for the tip, the septum, and the ostotomies, uh, ostotomies, which is up, up right there in there, in the nares, going up in there. All right, so now we've talked about the outside. Now we've talked about the nose. Palatoplasty. The palatoplasty is the palate. So that's the roof of your mouth. And uh, these codes would be 42200, which have nothing to do with congenital. And then it go well, except for the fact that people that have a cleft palate, that's congenital, right? But congenital is not in the code like it was for rhinoplasty. There is a lot of code for rhinoplasty, but those are specific for congenital. Uh, the palatoplasty is not listed as congenital, but if you have a cleft palate, you were born that way, right? So it's kind of built in. Then we have plastic repair, right? Just kind of going in and looking. It's, it's uh, what I did was I made this big and then I kind of did it in a row. So let's come down here. Uh, so that's a repeat, really. Uh, now let's look at the PCS codes. Uh, ICD-10 PCS is for inpatient coding. That code set is not like CPT. It's drastically different. It's actually a much better code set. And with that code set, it's based on what uh, you intend to do to the patient. What's the outcome that you want for the patient versus what you're doing to the patient. And I went ahead and took repair of hard palate, open approach, and notice the first character is med surge. It's always an O. What body system are we working in? The mouth and throat. What are we doing? The third character is the defining character for PCS. And we're doing a repair, and that's going to be a Q. And what body, body part? Hard palate. So these are our choices and our possibilities for an OCQ2, which means med surge, mouth and throat, repair of hard palate. We can do an open approach, percutaneous approach, and external approach, which is the O3 or X. ZZ are just meaning not, they mean not applicable for those. So the main characters that you have to figure out here is the third and the fourth character. Everything else kind of builds, builds itself. We're going to be revisiting this repair of hard palate again, but I wanted to, you to see how it's broken up. The PCS code is broken up. So other procedure codes for PCS. If we need to fit for a prosthesis, say we're not going to do surgery on this newborn, but the baby can't nurse. So we're going to put in a prosthetic until the baby's until we're able to go in and do the procedure because the baby's growing so rapidly. Then 
we're going to be looking at a different first character because we're not going to be in med search anymore. We're actually going to be fitting a device. And then the third character is going to ask what um, what body system, and in this one it happens to be an O. Then the third character is what are we doing? What's the outcome? We're going to fit a device. So that's a D. And then what are we fitting? A prosthetic device. Okay. And so F O D Z H U Z is the code for that. And would you have even thought that that was a possibility? But that is, is a code that you would need. And there's actually a CPT code uh, equivalent to that. Then let's look here at uh, another procedure to the lip and palate. These are repairs. That means the third character, notice that they're all a Q. So we have our OC, which tells us med surge, mouth and throat. What are we going to do? We're going to repair something. What are we going to repair? We've got the upper lip and then how are we going to access it? We've got the hard palate and the soft palate. All right. And then let's move down to replacement. If we're going to replace something, what? Replacement of the hard palate with an autologous, meaning tissue from the patient, uh, substitute open approach. And then we can also replace uh, with, what's the difference in this one? Hard palate, soft palate. Okay. Notice that it's a two for the hard palate, a three for the soft palate. Other things that can be done. This is just a rough overview, okay? Uh, high level overview, we'll say. Now we're going to supplement something. Supplement what? The hard palate. With what? A synthetic substitute, open approach. And then here we can supp supplement the hard palate with autologous tissue substitute. We can also supplement uh, autologous tissue external approach, open approach. And for the soft palate, um, let's see, synthetic and autologous open approach. So you kind of get an idea of how the code's built out. Another thing that's often done for these type of procedures is transfer what? Soft tissue, a soft palate, excuse me, open approach. So we're transferring something. We're transferring the soft palate, open approach. We've got the upper lip and lower lip, and the approach is defined. If we need to do an excision of skull open approach and you think, what are we doing? Actually, a lot of times when you have a, an infant with cleft palate, cleft lip, you can have deformities of the skull too. So you realize that the nose is actually an open hole here, right? And that's soft tissue. So that would be plastic repair. And then the lips are soft and you have your mandible, the, the jaws and stuff don't always have, there might be some abnormality in the bone here, but sometimes they even have abnormality in the skull going up from the mandible and, and uh, that, that didn't fuse properly. We can reposition the maxlia. So this is the, the mandible and the maxilla is the top bone of the jaw. Uh, and then there's internal fixation devices and of course the approach, more supplement of the right maxilla on the top, different from tissue from your own body. We can do an excision and you think, wait a minute, why does that say pelvic bone? Because if you need to replace a bit of bone here, they'll take it out of the pelvis. So you'd also be coding that. Alteration of what? The nasal mucosa inside here. They've got to, to change that up sometimes. Repair. We're going to repair what? The nasal mucosa, the nose, uh, external, and the septum. You can replace nasal mucosa. And I'm just going to briefly just kind of highlight these because we're almost to the end. I think that is the end. Supplement of the nose and uh, with autologous tissue and um, different approaches and repair nasal bone open approach. Again, maybe they had to go in to the pelvis, get some bone and graft it into the nasal bone or, or do a repair. I, now you see how these are not uh, codes that state they're specifically for congenital anomalies and deformities. However, 
where, for what other reason would you be doing a transfer soft palate open approach, right? Uh, unless there was trauma, trauma to the to the face and the skull, because this is not age sensitive. So you could, but we want to know how many of these codes are being used to fix one congenital defect, a cleft lip versus a cleft lip, cleft palate, right? cleft lip, upper lip, and lower lip. It's very intense. All right, that's it. Put this over here to the other end. Thank you, What is your status? Oh, did you want me to do the poll or do you want to, Boyd? No, you go ahead. I can. Okay, what is your status in medical coding, billing, or similar medical business related? Let me go over here and grab the poll. Let me make this go out again. I had closed it up. Oops. So our choices are looking at medical coding as a career, certified and looking for a job, employed, improve my current job situation in earning, and no, not pursuing employment at this time. Now, I kind of remember what we had last month, and already it's a little bit different <laughs> than what we had last month. There. And we are at 60%. So hurry up and get your vote in. Mm. We're at 70. So I get to count down. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we closed. <laughs> I like doing that. That's naughty, isn't it? Sixteen percent are looking at a medical coding career. Eighteen is certified and looking for a job. Thirty-five percent of you are employed. So that's that's fabulous. I'm glad that you're tuning in to um, uh, you know get some more information. 26% improve my current job situation and earning, and 5% no, not pursuing employment at this time. Thank you, guys. Let me put that back. And now it's Jennifer's turn. Let me Yay. just. <laughs> Make sure I wasn't muted anymore. <laughs> so, um, we had a question come in. They would like to know if it requires an initial visit from the rendering provider before a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant can bill for home services. So, what was quoted was uh, out of the uh, CMS uh, manual registration. You can bring it in. It's okay because it was a little bit differently worded. So per CMS, the home services CPT family range of 99341 to 99350 are paid when they're billed to report evaluation and management services provided in a private residence. Zoom in a little bit if you can, oh. dear Alicia, make it a little bit bigger if you can. Yeah. A home visit cannot be billed by a physician unless the physician was actually present in the beneficiary's home. So just that statement alone, and that's actually number one of the home services uh, guideline that they have, doesn't say who has to perform the first visit though. So I kind of did some digging around to see what we could find. So services that are provided in a home, as with all other locations, are based, you know, anything you do is based upon our state requirements, of course. So uh, the provider is practicing within the scope of practice per those state laws. So is a RN able to do something in one state that a PA does in another state? You know, so everything that all these services that are billed and submitted are, of course, based upon our state laws, which vary per state. So some requirements for a home visit would be, um, it has to have medical necessity of every visit. So if you go every week, that medical necessity is documented every week, clearly documented, um, reasonable and necessary, not for the convenience of the provider. Oh yeah, I'm available Friday afternoon. I can, you're right over there by, you know, my kid's school, I'll hit you then. Well, that's not a matter. That's a matter of convenience for the provider in cases like that. The services is of equal quality to a service provided in the office setting. 
if a provider is going to go to the home to see somebody, they're going to give them the exact same service they would in the office. Um, same uh, elements of the E&M service as well included in that. Um, the frequency of the visits is dictated by the medical necessity. The reason the patient needs or is requiring somebody to come to their home, not just because that site is a convenient location or it's you know near the nursing home that they go to all the time and, and check up there. So and the service is of a nature where a visiting nurse or home health agency doesn't provide. So there's a difference between a home service and what a home health agency nurse might come in and do. And we're going to break that down too in a minute so you can see. So the documentation has to support, your documentation must say that it's reasonable and necessary. And then you're indicating why it's reasonable and necessary. Prove that that visit is based on the inability of that patient to come to the office. Do they have some kind of physical issue, a mental issue? Perhaps they can't deal in society or crowds or, um, you know, not cognizant of their surroundings, perhaps, or other personal reasons, transportation, uh, no family members, no help, something like that. So how was this visit initiated? We need to document that. It's initiated because the patient called, says that they were released from the hospital two weeks ago. They're still in a wheelchair and they don't have anybody who with a special equipment or a vehicle to transport them. Well, that's, uh, they initiate it. We've stated the reason why. Um, and then the conditions that prevent. So they called us because this, so they needed a home visit. Of course, all the key e &M elements. Everything you're going to do in the office, you're doing at the home. You're doing the HPI, you're getting their history, you're reviewing their medications, you're doing an examination, some kind of medical decision-making process. That's where it's different than a home health nurse who comes in and is under orders of the doctor to change that bandage every two days or to perform physical therapy three times a week. Those home health agencies are under the direction of a provider, they're not hitting those key elements that are required for our e &M codes. So home services are like our office services and billable by a credentialed and eligible provider. Doesn't matter who that is. It could be the PA. It could be an MD. If that PA or that nurse practitioner is registered with that insurance company as a eligible provider to perform services, maybe they're eligible with TRICARE, but they're not going to get paid at 100%, but they're eligible to bill for their services. So they can perform a home service as well. It doesn't matter who it is, they would be submitting their claim with their information and receiving their rate of reimbursement. So if the insurances want to be, if the services the office is wanting them to be billed as incident two to Medicare. Medicare is the only provider that accepts incident two. Other carriers may in certain regions. I've seen, you know, possibly Aetna in a small region or something like that might accept uh, incident two. Incident two means that a medical provider, an MD or a DO, has gone out and evaluated a patient and established a plan of care. They've done the HPI, they've done the examination, they've done the medical decision making. They said, okay, we need to follow up with you after this severe fracture you had, you're unable to walk right now, we're gonna follow up with you every week to make sure you're okay. We're not coming in to do the wound dressing, that's your home health nurse. We're coming in to make sure your medications are okay or you know everything that they're gonna do at a normal office visit, they're doing in their home. So, but a PA can do that. Now that they've established that plan of care for a Medicare patient, that PA can bill for those services as the doctor. So incident two is a little bit tricky. We have videos out there about incident two if you're concerned about that, but remember it only affects Medicare. Um, 
so home health services, on the other hand, you know, they sometimes are confused. Home services and home health. Well, what's the difference? Um, home health services are provided by a home health agency, HHA. So these services are eligible. The patient must to for a home health agency to be assigned to visit a patient to do those things like um, PTI and R blood draws for Coumadin um, uh, medications, uh, blood pressure checks, wound checks, uh, physical therapy, some things like that. They must be homebound. They must be confined to their home, of which homebound is defined as due to an illness or injury that requires some kind of device, crutches, walker, wheelchair, something like that. Uh, something they require special transportation or assistance of another person in order to even leave their house. If they don't have anybody else there with them, then they're homebound. Or a condition that leaving the house is contraindicated. Okay, we have one of those conditions right now, COVID. They can't leave their house. Um, or, you know, some other uh, medical ailment that allows them to not get near germs or, you know, out be in the public. And an inability to leave the home exists. They can't leave their home for some reason. And leaving home requires considerable and taxable effort. I know we all think I don't want to leave my house. I don't want to get dressed today. I don't want to go to the grocery store, but that's not the case. This is the it's a considerable effort for these people to get ready to leave their house, um, especially somebody who can barely walk. They got to now get down their stairs and get to a car and get situated, and it's very taxing on them. They require skilled services from a home health agency, so they have specific physical therapists or nurses who are available to do these skilled services and you are under the care of a physician so your physician is the one assigning a home health agency um, they need a plan of care established and reviewed periodically by this physician so um, every 30, 60, 90 days, it could be a state requirement, it could be an insurance company requirement. Um, I believe right now they changed it in 2020 that home health agencies report every 30 days. So those physicians need to get those plan of cares signed off on uh, more ex expeditiously. Uh, have a face-to-face -face encounter is a requirement that's related to that reason. So that face-to-face -face encounter is done by a certifying physician, an acute care physician, perhaps they've just left a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility, so that acute care provider could assign their uh, home health agency and uh, sign off on this plan of care. A nurse practitioner, a clinical nurse specialist who's working with that physician or that acute care physician, a certified nurse, midwife, or physician assistant who's under the supervision. Those people can go out for that first visit and assess that and come up with that plan of care. But it's not a physician or a non-physician uh, provider who has a financial relationship with that HHA. They can't own it. They can't have investments in it or anything like that. Of course, now we're getting into our Stark laws and, and other uh, laws that we have out there in, in the medical field. And then that physician would bill one of these two HICPIC codes, either for the certification or the recertification to establish the home health care. Um, they use a G HICPICS code. And this all came from Medicare for if you're doing home health services, there is a brochure available on the CMS website about home health. But for our question was, did the provider have to go out there for the first time? It's not specific as to the type of provider. It's the same as if the physician, you know, if they were in the office, you'd bill it similar. But with our 12 place of service and our home codes, um, I did not tailor this towards COVID. COVID currently is offering different options for home services. This is billing home services, we'll put it non-COVID, non-PHE, non, -PHE, non uh, you know, our, our, uh, our health problem that we have currently. So I didn't want to get into all the COVID 
details with home services because they are much more flexible currently due to COVID. Um, and I not, you know, the question would then ask during COVID. So I just kind of kept it as a general question that could be used anytime. So that is a good stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did home health for five years. It was awesome <laughs> uh, to do that. I learned quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I bet. My, yeah. <laughs> my mother in law just had three weeks of home health because she had her knee replaced. That's why I'm in Missouri. Don't forget, it's time for a flash sale. If you want 30% off of our courses and the blitzes, real easy to do. Um, you can go to cco.us forward slash end of summer sale <laughs> because it is the end of the summer. Fall it was, it wasn't yesterday the official first day of fall? Tuesday. Tuesday it was yeah. Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Ooh, interventional radiology coding for cardiac devices. I have to tell you that this week I got to speak at and attend the uh, virtually remote the Richardson Texas Richardson Frisco Texas uh, local chapter and they had their symposium and I got to go last year it was awesome they had great speakers and they had great speakers this time too and one was a interventional uh, cardiologist so when I saw this question I was really excited with the advances in cardiology are there special codes for the cardiac devices being used I'm interested in getting a cardiology certification what's the difference in the credentials well so I kind of unpacked this a little bit differently uh, because I got really wrapped up in the devices that this particular provider uh, talked about Oh, look there, I did a, spelled it wrong. The first device I wanted to tell you about was a PFO occluder. And the provider uh, was telling us, and I'm trying to remember his name. I know I've got it noted at the, at the bottom. And this is and can be a congenital defect that I talked about earlier. So in between the two sides of the heart there's actually an opening and the blood goes back and forth it doesn't necessarily well i wouldn't call this a regurgitation but it pools and so you don't uh, the chambers of the heart are not uh, working effectively so this particular occluder kind of looks like this there's two of them he showed great um, graphics and pictures and stuff this is one that he showed us that I was able to go in and find his resource page and look at it so this would be a birth defect and these are the different uh, devices that are used for that this is um, the foramen overlay I guess is how you say that and what it does is they it's smooshed down in the catheter so the catheter goes in a lot of times it's femoral but doesn't have to be through the femoral it can be through the brachial artery and then, then they literally go up through the vessel go into the heart and you see that it's they just they come in through there and they stick it through there pull it back they open one side then pull it back and open the other side so here's one that's kind of a mesh type and here's another one that's um, kind of a you know it looks like it's cloth maybe it's silk I don't know so uh, the thing about this defect is it can cause emboluses and strokes so they need to make sure that it's taken care of so the, here it states the PFO serves as a potential conduit for venous emboli to cross into the left atrium and eventually to the arterial circulation and there is uh, more places where the uh, AHA journals and here is what it looks like when it's been implanted into the heart so you can't it's blown up so big you can't really see the heart itself but notice one side's bigger than the other so here's the right atrial disc and the left atrial disc and there is the opening see the defect right here and here so we should be able to see a line like this here is the catheter that's being inserted in and that's the other type 
So here's the one type, that meshy one, and there's the one that, that uh, the other one. And see the little catheter right here where they release it. So they poke it through, open one side, pull it, and make it snug, and then open up the other side and detach it. Really cool. Now, an, uh, an additional device that we've actually talked about before, we did, uh, it was on one of our monthly webinars because um, I got to do that one and it was pretty exciting about the Watchman device. That device is a left atrial appendage occluder. And when people have AFib, um, that is probably the, not the number one, but it's, it, it's, most common cause of stroke. So what they do is they put people on anticoagulants. But there's reasons that some people can't be put on an anticoagulant. So what they do is uh, they find out if it is a situation where they've got this appendage on the heart, then they can take this Watchman device. And again, it's it's all enclosed. It's not any bigger than the catheter that's going in. All right. And then what they do is they, they go in, they make sure it's nice and secure. Right. And then they open that up like a little spring and it will not let blood pool in here and cause clots and then go back out into the heart. Right. So this is what it looks like. And this is actually a picture of one um, on a scan. And you can see that little circle right there. It's pretty cool. So I encourage you, especially if you're in the club, you can go in and just type in Watchman and you'll be able to find that that particular uh, section. Now, TAVRs and TMVRs. So that's transcatheter aortic valve replacement or mitral valve replacement. This is huge right now. They do so many of them. Um, in fact, uh, the doctor that had given this lecture was from Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital there in Dallas, and he said in 2014 they did seven. That was when they started the program the, that um, they had a group of doctors together. They did seven, and then you notice here every year how many more they did of these procedures. So uh, if you think about that, these, these are procedures that are life changing. Well, all of these are, but this one has really taken off and um, uh, no, no side effects really for the most part. So uh, if you're looking up one of these procedures to code it, it's an implantation. Uh, so what are you implanting into the body? It is a valve. What valve? Well, it's either the aortic valve or the mitral valve. So it's cr then transcatheter. That's what that stands for. And this is what they look like. They put a balloon, he had really good pressures. A couple of these are pictures that he had, but his, he actually had showing you the procedure is awesome. Um, that's another reason to go to some of these symposiums and May manias and things. So the catheter goes in, and this again is not open like this. This is squished down all the way down to the size of the catheter. And here you see the aortic valve that is probably um, it's got stenosis and open, it won't open and close. So blood is just recurgitating back and forth. So this person would have, um, their vital signs would be off. They would be lethargic. They would get out of breath when they walked across the room, you know, and uh, once they have this replacement, it really changes their ability to have a, a better quality of life. Now there's more than one type of these. There's several of them. They constantly improve them. But once this is in there, it's an artificial valve is what it is. So you've heard of a pig valve. Well, that little piece of tissue right there that's inside that screen, that's that's pig uh, tissue, pig valve. And um, then this is the structure. So it's smashed down and they get it right where they want it and then they deploy it and it opens up. Now, there is a life expectancy on these. And I think about uh, the my mother-in-law having her knee replaced, those knees last 10 to 15 years, right? And so she's uh, 80 and uh, uh, so 
they like to do them when you're older because then you don't have to have another one put in. What he was explaining, which I didn't know this, but because these open up and and you know like do this, what they do is when these wear out, they just put in another one and then expands and pushes out against the walls of the valve. And they can do that several times. So let's say this has you know, a life expectancy of, I, I don't know, but uh, let's say six years. So when they, if they start to have problems and realize it's not working as well, they just go in and do it again. They, they don't take the valve out because actually the body kind of adheres to this, makes scar tissue. And so they just put another one in its place, open it up and it pushes this out, the, it expands out, but it still has plenty of room. And these come in different sizes. So they have to have a lot of prep work done before to, and they just keep using a smaller one because you're inside the existing one. I thought that was amazing. Um, another procedure that he talked about was the TMVR, which is the transcatheteral mitral valve repair. Now, this is a little different. When the mitral valve, sometimes it um, has this regurgitation. Uh, think of it uh, like this. It, it, the mitral valve isn't a tricuspid. It's a little bit different type of valve. But uh, what they do is they pinch these two pieces together. So you have your circle and the valve isn't working in between. So they pinch and make kind of a smiley face out of it in the center like they're doing here. And they uh, once uh, they get this in there and they catch it, then they release that and it pinches it closed. So it kind of makes two holes here, right? So it's not flapping around and uh, it works more effectively. But he said, this is a procedure that takes a lot of time and precision. So ultimately what they do is they have to do a lot of measuring and everything like the other valve, but they get the catheter in there and they've got the device and they they speed the heart up chemically. So they give you drugs and they raise, and he, sh he showed this in the telemetry and everything. They raise the heart. So if you have a heart rate of, let's say, just 70, okay, they raise it up to like 120. So that valve is going so fast, it's not even closing. It's just, you know, instead of doing this uh, or, you know, uh, it's, it's going like this. It's just quivering. It's going so fast. And then what they do is they put that device in there and then they have to like catch it right? It's like trying to do a um, whip stitch on uh, <laughs> on something that's moving around if you're a sewer, you know? Uh, so, uh, and then when they finally catch it, right, then they have to grab it, you know, and hold it and make sure it pulls. And you can see how this, if you had this bigger, you can see this has a little teeth on it and everything. And then it just literally sews that and then that thing pulls out this clip like this holds that together. That was just so cool. Oh, it was Dr. James Part. He presented at the Richardson Texas Symposium on the 18th, and he is with the Texas, let me go back up here and look again, because that was the percentage he said, I want to make sure he gets attribution. The Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas, and I think he said that they uh, intended, they expected to do like 250 of these procedures every year, and now, and they're doing 450 now. So, uh, and they have nine, uh, nine clinics slash facilities that do this interventional radiology. So if you are interested in interventional radiology, these are the devices that you'll be coding for. Now we have actually done other videos with the codes associated to each of these. And uh, so this time I didn't put the, the codes that, you know, specifically. Now the two difference are the two cardiology codes. One cardiology code is for cardiology in general, and the one for interventional radiology is called the CIRC. It's the C I R R C coding uh, interventional radiology. I R C I R C C. C R. I knew there was two letters. <laughs> C I R C C. And uh, we have one of our members that had um, they had gone to interview 
for a position and did a test. And she uh, talked about that last night on our, our um, office hours that we started for our students on Wednesday nights. We just have an hour and we do this. We just get online and answer questions that come up. And she had a list of the um, procedures that she was asked about to code and this was some of them. So uh, because she gave me more details and we're gonna share those with you in the future in the club uh, webinars, how to code those individually. That's it. Ooh, reviews. We get wonderful reviews coming in uh, uh, all the time. So we try to pick a current one. Boyd does a great job. Here's one that came in from Amy Murphy. She says, I got a 90% on the CPC exam thanks to CCO. The video lectures in the course make medical coding very easy to understand. You feel like you're right there in a classroom listening to the instructor. Also, the time practice exam and test taking tips made me feel confident and prepared for um, on test day. And that was a month ago. And if you want to give us a testimonial and let us know what was helpful to you, uh, the products that we offer, you can go to cco.us forward slash testimonials. And I would encourage you to go to our CCO proven process if you're thinking about testing. And there's the link there to uh, the cco.us, how to pass the CPC exam or any credential. We had another person that uh, last night that was on our uh, uh, office calls and she had just passed and now she's going to go set for her, um, uh, she wants to go get the inpatient, the CIC. And she also stated that, uh, you know, using our products, however, uh, she made a point to say that she took her exam online and she had no problems whatsoever. She said it went extremely smoothly. So that, that was great news to know that 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 was because we had some people thinking that was kind of a negative experience. So she had a great experience. All right. Hey. You can go ahead and put the sheet up okay. and I'll read from there because that one had some kind of typo or something. So let <laughs> me make it a little so, bigger for you. Yeah, sure. Yep. So we had a question come in about a specific HICPIC modifier, the EP modifier. Um, they're saying, to their knowledge, it's used for under 18 year olds for a full PE exam. Uh, is this modifier supposed to be used on other services? So, actually, there are this year 357 HICPIC modifiers. Um, so, you know, they get added all the time. Uh, plethora of HICPIC modifiers that if you have, you know, uh, one of the, I think it's the AMA book there, you know, you flip it open double page of the HICPICs and there's all this list of modifiers. This is so overwhelming. Um, but there are a few that we've mentioned and probably would seem uh, common to you. Um, we have our anatomical and our positional modifiers of, you know, fingers, toes, F0 to F9, T0 to T9, right, left, of course. Then we have some that, you know, Alicia would have just been talking about, the LC, you know, the left circumflex coronary artery. So some of them are positional or there's modifiers that you might have learned in a CPC uh, certification. Uh, training such as our anesthesia modifiers that we use P1 through P6 that give us the state of the patient as they're going under anesthesia healthy or have a, a moderate uh, comorbidity. Um, so some of them you probably wouldn't see very often like a Q3 which is a live kidney donor surgery and related sur services. So probably only if you work in that field are you going to use a Q3 for a live kidney donor organ. So, you know, there's so many different HICPIC modifiers that we have. So EP is stated as the service provided as part of Medicaid early periodic screening diagnosis and treatment program, which we abbreviate EPSDT, the early periodic screening. So, we love our acronyms in the medical field. Um, so EPSDT um, is a Medicaid program and they're what they're looking for, the E, the early, they're assessing and identifying problems early that could take place in 
individuals on medical assistance programs. We want to make sure that they remain healthy either through nutritional services or other medical services that may be, you know, some kind of environmental factors or something else that could be affecting their care, perhaps. The P uh, is the periodic. So looking at those age appropriate intervals, you know, when you take your child for their two-year-old checkup, their five-year-old checkup, certain things that they're looking for them to be able to do at that point in time and their milestones. Um, the E, uh, I did that one, sorry, uh, screening. So those tests, there could be uh, physical, mental, developmental, dental, vision, uh, hearing, uh, looking for any kind of potential problems with screenings. Uh, D is our diagnostic. So if there's a risk found, performing those diagnostic tests. One of the big ones that they do is a blood lead level. And then T, treatment. So to control, correct, or reduce any health problems. So this is a program established by the federal government that uh, through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that all children under 21, so up to the age of 21, so these benefits are allowed if they're on the medical assistance program. So our state Medicaid agencies, they are required to report these. Here we are again mentioning why we use these codes for statistical purposes. All of the state Medicaid agencies report these to the federal government annually as to there's a whole spreadsheet of things that have to be filled out, how many there were, how what the ages were, you know, all this different kind of treatment and that came from these screenings. So there's a lot of information that has to be reported. How do they know that was done? Through the use of this modifier. So the one thing we take away from this is this is for Medicaid patients. This EP modifier we're using to report for medical assistance carriers. So it's not used in every situation in either a family practice or um, you know, primary care provider's office. So some programs require that modifier to be used while some don't. So I looked up some examples. Every state is different, every state require something different. For what I found, Nevada wants you to use the 25 and the EP modifier on your preventive medicine codes. You gotta come back down a little bit, Alicia. Thank you. Uh, in conjunction with those immunization codes. So they're gonna give them an immunization at that time, uh, perhaps their Tdap, they're due for it or whatever. And their administration codes that they're using, as well as the preventive medicine codes that we use. Now, 9935, you know, is for ages 18 to 39. Well, medical assistance, you know, we're only going up through the age of 20 because that's for under 21, so through the age of 20. So we can still use that 18 to 39 code, but it's not for everybody, it's only through that age. Um, their website, the Nevada website, indicates that the EP will indicate a routine healthy kid screening that they've done, where other states have different requirements. Mine, for example, does not like modifiers, rarely used at all. There might be a dozen modifiers that are allowed on all claims that go into them. So they will allow 25, and then they allow the SE modifier uh, for those similar circumstances for those immunizations. So every state's different. So if you do work in that field and you do see medical assistance patients coming in for their preventive medicines, we need to make sure what modifier your state is wanting. So states may also require certain services to be rendered when using that modifier EP. So what does that mean? So Missouri lists, um, 10 components that are going to be performed for the um, early screening um, test that's being done, which can be broken down into a partial screening if only the first five components are given. Those first five components 
are the federal requirements. The other five that Missouri offers don't have to be done, but you have to do these five to meet your federal guidelines. So they would suggest using the EP and a 52 reduced services modifier to indicate that you didn't do all 10, you only did uh, the main five. So these five requirements are in also the CMS Medicaid manual that indicate there must be a comprehensive history and uh, health and developmental history done. We must have a comprehensive unclothed physical exam the appropriate immunizations, laboratory tests to include those blood lead levels, and health education. Those five must be performed uh, for the EPSDT exams. Now with federal medical assistance programs, the federal government establishes those services to be provided meeting the terms of a, a patient's application. So it could be low income, it could be some other kind of medical issues that warrant a patient to have medical assistance. So states do have flexibility that's allowed to them to offer more services should their funds warrant or perhaps based on their population, they see a lot of uh, certain issues with certain populations, perhaps maybe, you know, New York City, you know, maybe in New York, you might see more instances of uh, fluoride problems. Maybe there's not enough fluoride in the water or something like that. Um, so they might offer more dental services, perhaps, to their medical assistance patients. Or if they don't have it in their budget, you know, something that they have to offer the minimum. And the minimum is those EPSDT services that must be offered to all patients under 21 under a medical assistance program. So they have certain ways of reaching out to those patients and letting them know they that they can go in and have these services. So some plans offer limited care to members. Perhaps if they don't meet the uh, poverty guidelines, then they might get medical assistance for only certain reasons. Um, or something like that, a ward of the state, maybe they get full medical assistance uh, or they only get those EPSDT services. I've seen that on some cards that come through in Maryland too. They're only eligible for that screening service and that's it. But what if they find a problem during one of those services that the screening, maybe there is some kind of uh, anomaly that they found or a high risk factor. So. If that's the case, then the federal government and the states warrant additional services for that medical issue. It doesn't matter the level that that patient has of, say they only have that coverage of with only, you only get these benefits yearly uh, with your physical exam. Well, if they have a medical issue that they found from that, they have to now it's medically necessary that that medical assistance plan has to cover that as well. So if they find some kind of a heart anomaly and it's going to require surgery or therapy of some kind or maybe just an extra MRI or something, that is part of what they have to cover. So they could have what they call soft limits and hard limits. Um, they're they're not allowed to have the hard limits. They're not allowed to say, oh, you only get $500 worth of care for that problem and that's it. Now they might say, you know, their physical therapy might be limited, but they would take it as a soft limit. It's on a case by case basis. So if they found some problem and that's gonna require additional uh, visits for a patient, then that's something that could be given to them or it could require an authorization as well to extend those services. Then they're reviewing that. They'll do a utilization review, look at the medical records and see what's warranted to treat that patient because they're under the medical assistance program through the federal government. They're allowed to have this care. And um, so they need to you know, make changes possibly on a case by case basis. There was some uh, website information I found either through uh, medicaid.gov or the CMS website. So this is specifically for the entire blanket of medical assistance programs, but then each state 
might offer something different as well. So with a EP modifier, it is only used only with medical assistance programs for those visits that meet that uh, screening criteria of those preventive medicine codes. So it's not something you're gonna see very often. Sharon asked a question that you can probably give more detail on. Um, she wanted to know if uh, you're gonna be tested on needing to know the state by state uh, codes. I told her that the federal no. ones, yes, but if if they ask you about something specific, they're going to give you that information in the test booklet, and then you have to know how to read mm -hmm. it and understand it. Is that correct, or can yeah, you shed some the, light on that? Even on the CPB exam, um, you know, which is mainly dealing with billing, which is a lot more of the uh, things that we go over. Uh, you still need to know all those federal um, health care laws is more important, knowing the Stark laws, the, you know, business, um, not coming to me at the moment, um, some of the business laws that deal with HIPAA, you know, the security laws, things like that. When it comes to this type of program, they might test on you know, I've only taken the test one time. I don't know how many quizzes are out there, how many different kinds of questions they have, but it's gonna, um, you, uh, you'll you have approximately 10 questions dealing with, you know, insurances like that. But mm -hmm. I think, and I took it a couple years ago, so I'm trying to remember, um, more along the lines of, you know, that there are, that you know that there are certain that's what I was going to say. That are available, not what those elements are. Now you're going to need to know how much the fine might be for uh, abuse. You know, is it twenty five thousand or ten years in prison? I can't off the top of my head. I don't that know. Was definitely but but that you would yeah. need to know. But as to what is offered, no, you would need to know. Um, there are specific questions dealing with Medicare. Things that you do need to know, like um, for people over sixty five or on a medical condition. And then you also need to know who's primary, who's secondary, if they have yeah. another insurance coverage. Those kinds of things you learn, but not necessarily what's specific. Definitely not per state. The only thing you'd probably need to know is that each state has their own <laughs> things and that you can only do what the scope of their license says they can do in that state. That's probably the most you would be asked about a specific state requirement. But yeah, most of it is a generality of a medical assistance program that it's for low income or that you have a Medicare, Medicaid or Medi, Medi or everybody calls it something totally different, um, you know, out there for the options of our low income or our elderly or medical disability patients, so. Perfect. That's that's good. That's good. Oh, right. We have one more poll. It says, what is your medical background? Your choices are clinician, provider, coder, other, right in the uh, chat box, or none. Sharon said thanks, by the way. Well, uh, I guess you can see that now. <laughs> <laughs> So don't go to sleep, you guys. We're almost done. We want to stay to the end to see who our winner is. Ooh, wow. Okay, we're at 60%. I'm going to count us down. Five, four, three, two, one. Bam. And we have two clinicians, no providers tonight. Sometimes we usually have at least one provider. 66% um, of you are coders, 19% is other, 17% none. Oh, I didn't share it. I am so yeah. sorry. Well, we wow, do have a nurse and a foreign medical clinic. graduate. So that's close to a provider, right? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, I like the medical software one. I. I think oh. that's an interesting field because you can take all this knowledge and dabble with your computer, and you know, if you're tech savvy or something as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's right. Oh, right, guys. So the OIG, who are they and what did they do? Uh, this question came in. I saw that there were questions about the OIG on the practice exam I took. Who are they and what do they actually do? How much do I need to know about them when I go to test? Are they some secret agency like Men in Black, but for coding? Well, 
course I had to go find a picture of the men in black. This is not the OIG, by the way. <laughs> the OIG is the Office of Inspector General. They work for uh, HHS, which is Health and Human Services, which is the umbrella that they're the umbrella and OIG falls under Health and Human Services. And they've been around since the uh, 70s. And also, nobody wants to say Office of Inspector General, they just say the OIG. What is their number one? goal or well, I can say it's goal what's their purpose they fight waste fraud and abuse in Medicare Medicaid and in uh, it says uh, more than a hundred other departments within health and human services or the HHS programs now when I think of HHS I always revert back to risk adjustment because CMS always had risk adjustment and now HHS has risk adjustment. Why? Because it's federally funded now, as well as state funded. Let's say it's state funded, but federally backed. I guess that's the best way to say it. Whereas Medicare is federally funded and federally backed, as far as money's concerned. So health and human services, Medicare, Medicaid fall under that, and the OIG fall under that, as well as other departments. It's the largest inspector general's office in the federal government. So there is other uh, inspector generals for other departments, not just the HHS. And what do they do? The same thing. They look for fraud and abuse. Right? Uh, they're they're kind of I wouldn't say they're the policemen. They're the investigators. That's what they are. And uh, they have 1,600 dedicated. Uh, people that are combating both the fraud, the waste, and the abuse, and they also work to make HHS more efficient. There's a large group of people in um, the OIG that are cyber, cyber security, cyber um, type of um, work just to make sure that uh, everything's running smoothly. How can they make it better? So when uh, the Affordable Care Act went, it was enacted, and remember when the site went down the first day, boom, it kept crashing, then that's the OIG um, had, plays a big part in that and finding out why and fixing it. They do oversight. They also represent mostly uh, the vulnerable citizenship. So it's primarily the older people that they are looking out for. They also go into the Food and Drug uh, uh, Administration, National Institutes of Health, Disease Control and Prevention. This is the goals that came directly from their website. And if you go to the OIG's website, it's it's actually extremely informative. That symposium that I was on the other day, there was an OIG uh, person there that, that spoke, and she was awesome. Uh, she's out of Dallas. They have them all over the United States. And she also mentioned that they are going to be actively seeking coders for temporary jobs because they're getting ready to do some more ob uh, audits and uh, so you can you can absolutely go in and apply and at the OIG and I put the link at the bottom so what are their goals and objectives uh, we've already mentioned the fraud and abuse and waste because the, it may not be fraud and abuse but if they can trim waste then that allows for more money in the budget to care for those vulnerable people that we've talked about. They promote quality and safety and value. Um, you know, the one of the things that they work at is to promote public health and safety. So they've played a big part in the fight with COVID, right, and helping people understand the um, health and human because they're under health and uh, HHS, I'm going to say that from now on because I'm stumbling, then um, 
they are also part of uh, the COVID in collecting the data and making sure that everything gets out to the public that is accurate. And let's see, they do advances in excellence and innovation. Uh, if you go to the usajobs.gov and you look at the OIG, uh, you'll see that right now they have a, they're doing a big hiring uh, spree for IT people and uh, thought that was very interesting. But she did state that that, um, that was this week that they are looking for coders and um, you need to be certified, but they didn't, she didn't specify what credentials. So um, I think across the board, I'm, I'm sure they'd give you a test. If you can pass it, they'll put you to work. Yeah, uh, as far, uh, and it's a temp thing. You're contracted, I assume, uh, because she said it wouldn't be full time. But hey, wouldn't that be great to put on your resume, right? And that website again is usajobs.gov. What you're going to expect on the exams is this information right here. Right here. Fights fraud, waste, and abuse. And they will say, they will like give you a question about a scenario and they will say, who would would handle this? Who would come in and investigate? Or do, if they say investigate, it's probably the OIG, they're investigators. But if it has anything to do with fraud, waste, and abuse, it'll be the OIG in charge of it. And there you go. Well, it's an interesting tidbit that, you know, they fight the fraud, waste, and abuse, but the federal government has been looking into fraud, waste, and abuse since the Civil War, since <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. So I it. they have been doing that so for hundreds of years now. Because even back then, you know, people are charging more than they should for, and it's federal funded. So, you yeah. know, that's federal dollars hard at work. So they've been actually around since the Civil War. So I didn't know that, but to, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah fraud, waste, so and abuse. Yeah. They, they may have had different names, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the government, they weren't maybe called the OIG per, per se. I can't, yeah, I can't remember they, what they were. But yeah, they've been around for fraud, waste, yeah. and abuse in the go of government, of federal funds. There's been an agency that's been dealing with that, yeah. And they yeah. did say the OIG is part of more than just the HHS. Every mm -hmm. single one, like the agriculture, whatever, they have, a, you know, they have an OIG. And these guys have an OIG. And so it's kind of. Kind of cool. All mm -hmm. right, I'll move my move my face here. So our last question. I usually don't get to do the last question. So, what kind of wording would be on a hospitalist note to bill a prolonged service code in addition to a regular ENM? So there was a discharge summary that there was an hour and a half documented as spending with the family, the patient, answering all their questions before they're discharged. Um, so is it appropriate to bill a discharge code and a prolonged service code? So in, I'm going to, again, I'm going to stick with 2020 current CPT because we all know e &M codes are changing in 2021. Um, there is still information coming out about some of these codes that are changing. Um, and most of those changes, however, are office environments. So this is dealing with inpatient, but yet prolonged can also be used in office environments. So I'm going to touch a little bit on both, um, but I'm dealing strictly in 2020. So you're going to see where some things are mentioned that you're going to go, wait a minute, that's changing in 2021, and I know it is, but I'm going to stick right now with, with our, what we're currently using for at least the next couple months. So typically your prolonged service code, there's a family range from 99354 to 99359. That is both for uh, outpatient and inpatient prolonged services code. It is confusing because doctors, you know, all the time they're, I spend a lot of time with them. Why aren't I getting paid? Well, your normal e &F is that you get paid for spending that amount of time with them. So I, I used to hear it all the time that, 
well, I talked to him about this. Well, isn't that part of your medical decision making or your plan of care or things that you would have normally done anyway? So um, spending time with the patient depends on what that time was spent doing. Uh, so the e &M codes are currently, currently based upon your history exam and medical decision making process. Uh, where that medical decision making process could incorporate spending time talking to the patient. You're either going to talk about here's your options, you could do surgery, you could do, you know, conservative treatments, or, or I'm going to send you for an MRI and this is why, and then if that comes back this way, we're going to do this, or you're going to have a biopsy, you know, they can go over all these things with you. That's part of that medical decision making process that they're spending with you. So it doesn't mean, always mean that it's prolonged time. So prolonged E&Ms, 99354, is a pro, beyond the typical service time of that primary procedure. These are add-on codes. We don't bill prolonged services without a main code. They have the little plus next to them. In the office or an outpatient setting is 354 and 355 that require direct patient contact beyond the usual service. That's one of the main terms we're looking for and we'll elaborate on that a little bit. So then you can do each additional 30 minutes as another additional add-on code with 99355 with an office setting. Uh, 356 and 357 is your inpatient requiring uh, the floor time beyond that usual service. So Looking at uh, 358 and 359 are codes that are without or direct patient contact. I'm not going to talk about those. 415 and 416 is prolonged clinical staff time uh, beyond that normal uh, physician time. So I'm not going to talk about either of those, but there are other prolonged services codes out there. So we said beyond the usual service. Well, I go to CMS for a lot of my information. So um, CMS says uh, beyond the usual service is that time for the usual service refers to the typical or average time units associated with the companion e &M service code as noted in CPT. So we have our you know, establish our problem focused and our comprehensive. And then it tells us as we're choosing the code, approximately 25 minutes are spent face to face with the patient. That's the time that we're looking at, that what they note in CPT, which again, next year changes, okay? The companion E&M service. So per CMS, they defined what is a companion E&M service. Well, for the outpatient 99354, it's a family of codes. And for the inpatient 99356, there's another family range of codes. You can bill these with any one of those family ranges. Face-to-face -face physician presence. CMS says you cannot say it's face-to-face -face physician presence when in the office setting the time is spent by the staff of the patient, you know, they come check in, you might have a you know, med tech ask them questions or they talk to a receptionist or that's not part of your time. Or the time the patient's sitting there alone, <laughs> unaccompanied in the room or in their office, you brought them back to a room at 10 o'clock, but you didn't get in there till 10, 15. You don't count that 15 minutes. So they've been, they were unaccompanied during that time. In a hospital setting, it's a little bit different, but time spent reviewing the charts or discussing with another staff member in the hospital um, and not your direct face-to-face -face contact with a patient or waiting for test results, changes in their condition, you're hanging out waiting for that, the end of therapy, or use of the facilities in a hospital setting is not time documented is not your face-to-face -face time with the patient for prolonged services. So what should be documented if we want to bill prolonged services? These medical records are not submitted with the claims, so we don't have to make them look pretty and bundle it all up and send it out with a claim to make sure that that claim is supported. But 
in case that medical record is requested, it should include the duration and the content of the medically necessary E&M service and the prolonged services. So you're describing your HPI, your exam, your medical decision making, you're describing what you talked to them about, what you did, and how much time. So you must, and this is quoted here, so directly out of CMS, you must appropriately and sufficiently document in the medical record that you personally furnished the direct face-to-face -face time with the patient as specified in CPT code definitions. Make sure that you document the start and end times of the visit along with the data service. So I have a physician who likes to tell me all the time, I personally performed 45 minutes of face-to-face. -face. That's what he says that he likes to put at the bottom of every record. I kind of have to remind him, remember that's the actual time you spent with the patient because I've audited records before and this is what a uh, will happen when a, a record is audited. They're also going to request your calendar, the check-in, check-out times, or the schedule of all those patients. And now that everything's electronic, those check-in, check-out times are a little bit easier. And if you've documented you've spent 30 minutes with every patient between 10 and 11 and you saw five patients, things don't add up. You spent 30 minutes with the patient, but they came in at 10 and left at 1022. That's not 30 minutes. So we need to make sure that we're appropriately and accurately documenting that information. With office services, CMS has a threshold table. This is only a portion of this threshold table. There's, there, are, there are more codes. Um, but they also give us a couple examples. So I wanted to bring up two of these examples so you could see what we're talking about here. And you could kind of picture it in your head and see if it would be prolonged service. So a physician performed an office visit to an established patient that was predominantly counseling, spending 75 minutes of direct face-to-face -face with the patient. So he bills a 215 and one unit of 99354. Okay, because 215 says 40 minutes of time. He spent 75. Okay, and you can see our threshold there for a 215 is 70, and he went over that. So he can bill that because the threshold was 70. He billed 75. He bills a 215 and one unit of 99354. Here's another example. This is what we can't bill. A physician provided a subsequent office visit that was predominantly counseling, spending 60 minutes face-to-face -face with the patient. Well, we said our threshold was 70. So he can't bill that. And you think, well, what about a lower service and a prolonged services code? So you can't bill a 214, which has a typical time of 25 minutes, and then a unit of 99354. The physician must bill the highest level code in that code family, which is a 215 with 40 minutes, leaving 20 minutes beyond the code, which does not meet that time threshold. So, um, you know, we think, well, I'll lower code it and then we use a prolong. No, you can't do that. You have to bill that highest level in that family of code. For the hospital services, we have 992, you know, we have all of our families and they have a prolonged service time uh, frame as well. So there's a lot of different codes that you probably recognize on there, knowing your, um, you know, hospital codes. And they all give that threshold of time. Well, if we go back and look at what did this question ask again? I had a discharge summary. The phys physician spent an hour and a half and the family, you know, answering those questions. Can I do a discharge code and a prolonged services code? A hospital discharge code is 99238 or 99239, 30 minutes or less or more than 30 minutes. Those are the two options. Hospital discharge is not one of those family of codes that CMS or CPT says can be included you know, for prolonged services. It's not listed on that table for inpatient settings. CPT also describes it as the hospital discharge day management codes are to be used to report the total duration of time, total time spent by the physician 
for the final hospital discharge of the patient. Doesn't matter what they talked about. They didn't ask, you know, well, he spent time, but then did additional time talking about other, you know, answering their questions. So CPT says we're going to use 99238 or 99239. That's it when you're dealing with a hospital discharge. And even the parentheticals that we should remember to keep looking at, especially on a CPC exam, that 99356 prolonged inpatient service, the parenthetical says you use this in conjunction with, again, these family of codes, and that hospital discharge is not there. Also, prolonged services codes are not allowed to be used with telehealth services. Thought I'd throw that out there in case there's, you know, COVID things happening and you see these codes right now for prolonged services with a telehealth. It's not allowed. Um, so this came directly from, you know, CMS, uh, uh, my go-to person. So for questions, um, so there are codes that can be built prolonged services in a hospital. So the first part of the question, yes, there are codes and they, there's that timetable threshold there. But then if it was specifically a discharge code with a prolonged service, no, we can't do that. So. Very good. All right. Are you a member of the CCO club? Let's find out real quick, probably our last poll. Your choices are, nope, I launched the wrong one. Hold on, <laughs> let me run through it. This one already did it, okay. I, I was gonna say, those numbers look the same. <laughs> are you a member of the CCO club? There we go. The questions, very easy. Yes, no, I decided not to join at this point, or no, I didn't know about it. Is it important? Yes, it is. <laughs> You guys are not asleep. Man, you should see those numbers going up. We're already at 50%. Now we're at 60%. So we'll get to 70, which we're going to hit it in just a minute. Five, four, three, two, one, bam. Oh my, 42% wow, said even. yes. No, not at this point. And 16, should I? Yes, yes, it's an awesome um, thing to be a part of because, as I mentioned before, all of these answer sheets, if you're part of the club, you get access to those. Otherwise, when the webinar is over, you're done. You may be able to see something on YouTube, but you won't be able to see those. So the CCO club is awesome. It's real easy to find. It's cco.us forward slash club. <laughs> Did you get value from tonight's Q&A webinar? I guess we are going to have time to do that. And then we're going to draw from for our winner. I think they're getting ready to do that in the back. Already. Yep, we got it already. All right. So launching, your choices are yes, no, please leave a comment in the question. And hmm, not sure, please leave a comment. So, huh. oh my, it was like, bam, 60 like that. Everybody's saying yes. So we're already at 70%. So thank you very much, guys. We appreciate that. We we work hard to, to get these out to you and we have fun doing it. I learn something every time, every time. That's because I always learn something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was uh, I was watching. In fact, one well, time I scrolled down ahead. She's like, "Don't go down that far." Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm I'm uh, gonna give you a little tidbit here. Alicia loves PCS. You know, she talks about it all the time, right? I'm learning PCS by teaching it, and I was like, "Wow, this isn't so bad after all." <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> so much better than CPD. And you guys, since we got your approval, we would love for you to take a survey for us and let us know how we're doing. Uh, that's real easy. Just find it at cco.pe forward slash QA2020209. Were you 20 in 2009? No, uh, 2020, <laughs> September. <laughs> oh, I wondered where you come up with those. Now I feel really stupid. Duh. That's what my kids say, duh. 
I get on to them if they do that. Um, so our winner, Boyd, who won? They get a, vi a Blitz video package, one year of the CCO Club Basic, or an hour session with me, or maybe somebody you else. Know, I, could, I have a sound effect that I could probably load. I'm going to do that next time. Um, anyway, um, so <laughs> Le Le Lenora Gorman is our winner tonight. Lenora Yay! Gorman. Lenora golf clap Woo! good for you Lenora so it's real easy if you're the winner then you just go send your message to help desk at cco.us and they will jump on it to help you there they've got your name and they will um, absolutely well they'll find out which one of those things that you picked uh, real quick we're getting ready to do the behind the scenes kind of the questions that came up in the chat and this is the official end of the webinar uh, however if you want to stick around that's fine please feel free to do so this is called stump the <laughs> stump, <laughs> stump, stump the quarter <laughs> oh, just a second i got that I saw questions pop up and I didn't see which ones they put in here. So we'll, Let I didn't look up any it. of them ahead of time. So we'll see. <laughs> usually Jennifer does, but she's usually not the last, she's usually not the last speaker, right? I oh, did not. okay. I learned something. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> <What's> that? <laughs> how she does that. She, she, she. Oh, how, how what? smart I am. Yes. Yeah. Cause I'm. Yeah, usually. No, it's, no, it's more like. I'm having out my books while you guys are talking. <laughs> no, you're helpful. Yeah. So we're not sitting there with dead air, put it that way. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Lori, for putting these together. This is the first question. Doctors upset for getting downcoded. Any suggestions for dealing with doctors who hang up on you and get upset when you try to explain to them why you downcode their charges? Anyway, to educate them, I had one today where I downcoded who got $150 left. She hung up on me and said I was wasting her time why do they get upset if they won't listen to your explanation? Well, I do provider education. <laughs> I don't really have a good answer for that. I always like think giving them chocolate works, but <laughs> uh, do you have anything wise to well, say? Well, the only thing I can think of is, is in a, and I know this came from a facility type of, um, you know, a coder. So, they need to have a time established with management to go over these types of things mm -hmm. because whether it's monthly, whether it's you get five minutes at their monthly meeting, whether they, they need to have a decided upon format for these kinds of discussions. And, um, you know, I understand in a facility, everybody's busy. They're not there at the same time. So they're all working different hours, things mm -hmm. like that. So there needs to be some kind of uh, implement, some kind of, and it goes along for your compliance as well, because that's very important that you have these rules set up as to what they can bill and, and that they need to be aware of what has been coded incorrectly as well. So whether they get a monthly report and then they can have, a couple minutes to ask you questions about it maybe might be a little bit easier way and I always find that fascinating that people say my doctors were upset because they didn't get enough money and I'm like doctors are should be there caring for the patient and not looking into every code that you submitted and comparing it to what they told you to submit I, I'm always fascinated when people say that I'm like how do they know what I did and how do they know what you get paid and how do you know I'm yeah. just kind of how do they know I changed it? Because they <laughs> yeah. I'm coding properly is what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. I, I found that um, facilities and groups that have, like Jennifer said, good education, where they meet on a regular basis, that usually usurps a lot of these problems. However, um, I've also found that the providers that are feeling this, there's something else going on, right? There's something else behind the scenes. So they aren't necessarily upset with you per se and the $150 less, which that, you know, that may be, you don't know that they didn't get a speeding ticket on the way to work or <laughs> their spouse just spent, you know, um, 
five thousand dollars on a new pool or uh you know i mean you, you don't know the behind the scenes and um pools don't cost so, five thousand dollars just fyi you knew that i was like i don't no, know i don't have a, a pool <laughs> you know, really hot tub, maybe hot tub, you can, I don't know, um, a golfing trip, you know, uh, so, so again, the, there's probably something else, but there are departments, especially in facilities that handle this. One is the compliance office and, um, every hospital and, uh, doctor's group, not necessarily individual, um, doctor's offices and stuff, if they're part of a system, they have provider education. And um, I would save uh, the, uh, the patient, you know, and the scenario and uh, keep track of that. And then you can check in and find out who's doing the education. It may be compliance, uh, usually is under CDI in the departments, not, you know, if you don't know, uh, but, uh, find out from your upline who's in charge of provider education and um, let them know the scenario so they can use an example to to um, flag it flag if this is happening repetitively for that patient that i mean not that that patient but for that provider there's something else going on uh you know if they know. say you're losing me money then well and i know too you know we always say how do how should we approach them um and for one, they are busy. Even doctors mm -hmm. in my, you know, in my clinic, they're like, you see them joking around with people, but that's just because they're releasing, they're venting for a minute. They're yeah. not sitting there for an hour joking with them. You might walk by at the time they're going, oh yeah, you did that last night? Oh, that must have been fun. As they're walking into a room, you mm -hmm. know, um, but if we notified them that, hey, I've come across a couple problems. Can I have five minutes at the end of the day to go over yeah. them with you? So we collect them all, or can I meet Friday before you start clinic or at lunch or something at their end of their week, perhaps, and not the, where they're blindsided. They sometimes don't like that too, because they might feel that you're questioning their care as a doctor. You're not questioning their care or them. You're just informing them of, for the future purposes, we don't code it like that. We code it like this. But right. um, yeah, it's, yeah. And I, I kind of I actually saw her, you know, that come through and I didn't read the whole thing. And I was thinking too, it's the same thing working in the billing department. The mm -hmm. patients call you and complain and they yell at you. And, you know, you yeah. personally didn't provide the care. You personally didn't do anything. And it's always hard when people unleash on you and it's kind of the, you know, we see it so much right now with social media, people unleashing mm -hmm. that you go, uh, why do you handle it that way? You know, or people just get so upset, but then they seem fine after <laughs> usually yeah. people need to vent. But um, uh, we get the same thing from the patients. Mm -hmm. Why did I get this bill? Well, it could be they just didn't understand. They, nobody told them. So if we take that second to explain it to it, explain it, they might go, Oh, I see what you're talking about now. Oh, yeah, you're right. I was seen that day. I'm sorry, you know, or yeah, I forgot that my daughter brought me. I knew my car wasn't available, but I forgot my daughter brought me or something like, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to call Medicare and I'm going to report you as fraud until you explain it. And they go, oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> I like so, it when they get that bill which is not really a bill. It's an itemization of everything yeah. that happened to them and the cost off to the side. And they're like, oh, 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 you know, and then they look at the bottom. It's like, but see down at the bottom, you owe nothing. because this You charged me $45 for Band-Aids. I could have got that from CVS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that one, one more thing that uh, doing provider education, I think it's uh, like Jennifer said too, timeliness it seems that seven o'clock, 1230 and 530, those are the three times that they slot for uh, meetings. And uh, they usually have one day a week that they huddle. They call it a huddle. I don't know. Why. And um, so if you can get into that sweet spot and find out who who runs those and, you know, can I have five minutes, 10 minutes to give a, a quick presentation on why, you know, uh, on these codes, because honestly, they don't, they don't like doing the codes. They, uh, it's, it boggles their brain. It's not what they, you know, we used to do that for them. 
they we used to harp on them about documentation. Now we harp documentation, and you got to pick the right code. <laughs> you know, so um, I kind of feel sorry for them, and yet I don't want them hanging up on me either. But and 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 value too. I I did talk to a bunch of uh, doctors about a new tool that's coming out, but they were palliative care, and this particular tool that was coming out for them to use with the platform wasn't real that wasn't applicable to them the risk adjustment wasn't applicable so I sat down with one of the other the main guy who is also an educator and man we got so much extra information from him about what would be applicable to them so again you might find out that that doctor might become a real good friend of yours when you find out what the needle is for them no the thorn the thorn ENM nurse visit. Why is an ENM code for nurse visit not included when you code it? I don't understand what that means. Um, Why is it not paid? Why is it? Why is an ENM code for a nurse visit not included? Maybe it's and when do you code it? And when? Well, because the ENM code for the nurse visit is not going away in 2021. The only one that went away is. 99201. Um, now, when depends on what that nurse is doing. If you're coming in for the nurse visit and you're giving their flu shot, if they're scheduled for the flu shot, you're not billing the visit, you're billing the flu shot. Right. Um, a lot of people try and do the 99211 with a 25 modifier in whatever service is being provided, but that code is inclusive of the service provided because it's a five minute. 99211 very minimal service code. So I'm kind of not really, I don't see, or whoever asked it might have jumped in and, and explained it a little bit better. So I'm not quite sure. What do you think? That's, I, I think so too. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm looking over to see if anybody clarified. Mm -hmm. mm. Ooh, someone asked, uh, do you have, Hema and Ankh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually have some in the wings. Yeah, to be doing some provider education for that. And uh, those are uh, neuro oncology on also wasn't interested <laughs> in risk adjustment stuff. Um, sorry, we're not sure exactly what that, that means. But if you want to say in the forum more specific, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Code 92552 with Medicaid or Medicare, do you append Q? W. Well, Jennifer has this one memorized, right, Jennifer? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Is it 92552? 92552. Yeah. 92552. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Diagnostic test. Did you get it up there? I'm pulling up. Yeah. Because my, mm -hmm. I can actually look at things while doing the webinar. I couldn't do that in Texas because my internet's so bad. But my screening test. internet is awesome. Oh, it's a pure tone um, uh, audiometry, mm. uh, air only. And let me see what they're saying here about it. Uh, if you well, want to try and answer that one. Yep. Maybe, yep. Uh, uh, you can, the oncologist specialty with chemotherapy, we actually did a webinar not too long ago on uh, uh, chemotherapy medications, and you can find that in the club, and there might be some of it out there on YouTube, but I think it's um, Kathleen that's been attending a lot of our webinars. She knows chemo drugs really well she did cancer it's so funny you said that and her name popped in my head as you were saying she's it. like yeah she's <laughs> on top. yeah yes. she she's worked in that field for a while yeah so she's been given us information and then we've been able to do some research and kind of highlight some of that so uh hopefully we'll have some more for you if we know that that's what you're looking for what did you find the, out well the qw modifier is for clinical lab it's a clia wave <gasps> oh. test and I'm not sure why a CLIA wave test would be with an audiometry. I don't think it would why be. Why you would use that. Yeah, because a CLIA is the clinical lab. Yeah, it would be a blood and test. audiometry is not, you know, that's an air. Unless they checking, put you know, in the checking. wrong 92552 if that wasn't the right one. Yeah. Hmm. 
So the yeah, answer would, is yeah, I wouldn't put a QW. No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put a QW on. Yeah. That would be bad. <laughs> it will get booted back at you. Um, all right. So uh, if you didn't know, we are hopping on YouTube. We really, really appreciate you, uh, the ones of you who watch us on YouTube and throughout the week. We are now over 4 million views. <laughs> Wasn't it we just 4 million in our last in August? Yeah. Are we just had gotten to 4 million or we were about to hit 4 million? Yeah. 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 yeah just a, so, it's it's a hundred thousand already since last month. That's amazing wow. guys. Thank you. Um, uh, 32 over 3,200 subscribers and we have almost 1500 videos in there. 30, 1, 000. 000. Yeah. 1,432 <laughs> videos. Did I say it wrong? He said 3,200 subscribers. 32,000. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I meant to, I meant to say what Jennifer said. Okay. Uh, would you rather have $3,200 or $32,000? Thousand. Thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, and it, that was not an excuse of the glasses. That is, that was me just not thinking straight. Uh, so how you help us guys is you subscribe. When you subscribe to our channel, which is Medical Coding Cert, that helps us. We don't advertise. Uh, it's word of mouth. And um, also when you share our videos. So if you're on LinkedIn, you can share our videos. You can share our videos on Facebook or sending them to a friend. Uh, you know, that that is extremely beneficial. The more we uh, have happen on our YouTube, then uh, that helps uh, the powers that be on the internet traffic stuff to our website. And that's what we want to happen. We want them to go to our website. But we also have a Facebook page and Lori gets that going. So she she showed something today that was a real funny. Um, I like her word of the days that she does. Uh, but if you want to find us there, it's simple. Facebook.com. CCO.us. So make sure that you go in there, you like us, and you share the content that we have. I go in and share the stuff that Lori puts on there on my LinkedIn. And that being said, we all have LinkedIn uh, profiles. If you want to go in mm -hmm. and check us out on LinkedIn, uh, we would love to, to see you there. And um, hey, I, Alicia, I'm, hmm? at the end of the year, I want you to put a board in front of yourself and see if you can smash it. Because I'm getting yeah. <laughs> That's not even a, a You're working on your karate chop. <laughs> I got to come up. I got to do something cuter than that, though, because this looks kind of stupid. Um, if you are needing, we, we still do remote presentations for your local chapters. Now local chapters are meeting again, and some of them were doing remote presentations, uh, you know, before COVID. But... Um, by all means, check out what we have to offer. Uh, let us know if we can help you in any way now that some of the chapters are getting back out there and meeting. The symposium was remote for the first time that I went to last week, and it went off without a hitch, which was uh, it, uh, mostly in part, I think, to the the officers. And uh, Kimberly, uh, William, Kimberly Jovelet. I don't know how you say her middle her, that uh, she's got a hyphen her last name uh, Williams she she ran the whole thing and it was great let's see don't forget to take that survey the cco.pe forward slash QA 202009 not a 20 years old in 2009 but the year 202009 for the month um, the CCO club, very easy to find, cco.us forward slash club. Tell your friends and come and say hi to us in the club. And that's it. That's a wrap, guys. That's a wrap. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us and come back again next month. We take off December usually every year. So yeah, um, we still got October and November to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And also every week, uh, we've got Alicia there, um, usually two times a week. I think I'm not going to say anything because we don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday, but hopefully you'll see us back live Jennifer. on Tuesday. Might be, <laughs> might be Jennifer. So. God willing. Yeah, I'm going back from uh, Missouri to Texas. So I just 
just in the event. And thank you for all the compliments on my hair. Uh, my In Missouri, my husband's cousin's up here. Whenever I get to Missouri, I, she does amazing things to my hair. And she integrated my gray and gave me grayish blonde highlights. It's pretty silver looking in the in real life. Nice. Yeah, you Thanks. look great. All right. Good night, guys. Do you need more medical certification and business training? Learn more at www.cco.us.